Won't find them until they want to be found. See them until they want to be seen. But remember, they see and hear all that happens in the mire. Okay. She ran off toward the orphanage. Kids could know <laughs> something. Or the old woman who takes care of them. Oh, that old hag don't speak to strangers. And you're a stranger. Will she talk to you? I have spoken to her. Got my ways. So be it. You helped me and I'm no bore. Come with me. Hey, hey, hey. I can keep up with this guy trotting. Trotting on Roach is as fast as this thing at full speed. Careful! Watch out! Hey there. Damn it. Run, Roach. Come here, Drowner! Oh, stop changing your mind, game! There we go. This is bad, this is bad. Get out, get out. There you go. Come back here, water hag, in the slow-mo epic quality. I'm gonna take you now, I'm taking your head off. Gonna die, drowner. You're gonna drown to my blade. I'm gonna cut off your head just like that. Now that I've done slow-mo, it's so awesome to fight. I'm gonna take you out and back. I'm gonna make you feel right by docking your head off. Woo! I missed you, damn it! Now I'm gonna knock your head off, girl. Yeah, but I was going for the rhyme, man. I was going for the rhyme. Listen, when you're in the midst of a rhyme, you just can't you can't bail out. You know, you can't bail out on it. <laughs> you just got horse witched. <laughs> I feel like you should be able to strike a pose. You just got horse witched. That's totally what is missing for this game. You just got Geralted. All right, Johnny. Uh. Okay, can I now get on my horse, please? In the midst of a rhyme, I can't spare the time. The clock doesn't stop, so I rhyme till I drop. What's up? Slow now. Are you serious? Okay, fine. Fine, fine, fine. Come on, Johnny. Very clearly, the game was like, we don't want you riding the horse the whole time. I was like, all right. Less epic. Yeah, but the pri exactly though. You do more damage on the horse, and it's a little bit less dangerous. So that was my theory. Good. It's clear. Not a crone in sight. I need to sing to Gran. That ought to calm her. Little Johnny softly gazes, fire waning pale. Pop! A spark jumped out and whispered, Listen, I attack. Yo, I got your voice back. I did, though I seem to have lost an octave somewhere in the process. I shall look for it when I get home. You're not allowed here, Johnny. You shouldn't have come. 
calm down, Gran. Don't get angry. It's not good for you. The woman I asked about earlier. <laughs> Forgive me, Gran, but this fellow absolutely must talk to the lady. He's got the leading man no. look. She's not allowed. Please, it's important. The fellow will be quiet. Gran, please hear me out. I found little Yagna when she got lost, did I not? Did I break Jenny's fever too? I did. I ask anything in return? No. Didn't even fuss about my stolen voice. Well, now I want something. Gran, help this fellow. Because otherwise he'll pester me day and night, even during potty time. His lass is missing. Perhaps the ladies can help find her, eh? Well, since you put it that way, Johnny, I'll help him. Come with me. Thanks, Johnny. Johnny's a good, good lad. Though the ladies don't like him. No. Foul creature. It's a good question, don't. I don't know. Don't like him. Who are the women in the tapestry? Those are the ladies. Ladies lovely. With power o'er all. Beseech I thee. Answer my call. Before you a worm crawls, wretched and small. Interesting. How dare you disturb our rest, woman? I'm looking for the woman with ashen hair. I know you met her. Where is she? Oh, he's impatient. Perhaps he only likes ashen-haired girls. Thank you for the follow, Mason. Welcome to the Arbonauts. The young woman. She's my daughter by choice. I raised her. <laughs> if she's shapely, what does it matter? <laughs> Matters to me. I believe we've hit a nerve. He's bubbling like wealth in East. Oh, that's how I like him. It's clear you met her. Tell me everything. That was blunt. Well, perhaps it's for the best. Tell me, have you got bollocks? Do you fear woodland beasts? Oh, hard times are upon us, white-haired one. Brother has turned against brother. The land is soaked in blood. I'll answer Evil that in just a sec, EMC. Stronger than ever before. A dark power has surfaced near Down Warren. It feeds on hatred and disdain. Destroy the beast, and we may be grateful. Tell you all we know about this ashen-haired maid. Dark power? You need a knight errant, or a witch hunter, not a witcher. The Orderman of Down Warren will tell you all. Remember to collect payment from him after you complete your task. I know, right? I... And now our servant will bring you the dagger. But what about, uh. What about the Baron's daughter? A dagger? What for? When the Orderman sees this dagger, he'll know we sent you. He laid with all. I'll talk to the alderman, but I can't promise anything. Move, woman! Give the young man the dagger. And you, white one, return only once you've completed the task.
Oh, you missed this right on me way. Dagger, gotta bring the dagger. No wonder she's a mess. The dagger for you. Ladies told me to give it to you. Here it is. The dagger. Whoa. Place the alderman's payment on the stone. Stone bear, stone shear, stone nose, stone ears. Okay. That's that quest updated. But I got confused because I thought I was... Yeah. That was what I wanted to do, and I think I was doing the wrong quest. Alright, well... So all remaining leads in Velen. So basically that's the dead end, right? So somewhere in Velen... Yeah, you only kill the creepy ones when they can't be helpful. There's the crone's dagger. Alright, that's gonna do that, but I still... Still trying to figure out. I want to finish up with the Baron quest, though, and like find the Baron's wife. Anna would have to be in Crookback Bog. Okay, so Anna is somewhere here. So we are in Crookback Bog, right? So somewhere, Anna, so Anna is somewhere here. In Crookback Bog. First of all, let me save it. All right, look, let's kick it, Roach. That's fine. So they're so they're connected to each other. So in other words, if I'm working on this quest, that's not going to screw up my ability to do the other quest, right? If I'm working on this quest right here, the uh, Family Matters, uh, not the Family Matters, the Ladies of the Wood quest, that's connected to Family Matters. Like, that won't screw up Family Matters, right? I just want to make sure it's not going to screw it up. That's all. No, don't spoil that for me, but I just want to make sure it's not going to screw it up. That's all. No, it's not? All right. All right. What are we doing on time? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you cannot fail main quests. Well, not main quest, but the, but the thing is, yeah, everything's connected. Great. All of a sudden, it's like some massive conspiracy theory uh, movie. No, um, I know you can't mess up a main quest, but I'm actually, this is the quest. Oh, this is a main quest. Oh, never mind. Never mind. I was like, but then this is, oh. Is it the soothsayer? Wow, that heart. Look at all these side quests. All right. I want to do these first, and then the side quests are going to be next. But I'm not going to do it now. Illuminati confirmed, right? Exactly. Okay, cool. Lovely. Good times. Okay. 
All right, so uh, as I had promised you guys, um, the uh, reading, and it's actually later than I wanted to start. I wanted to start the reading at 1, not one twenty, but that's okay. I will do it. So um, so uh, this is, um, we have done the a few poems today to fulfill that part of the Patreon. I did the um, one fighting fantasy session. There's one left I have to get in by the end of the uh, end of the month. Um, and I have sent out uh, the draw, uh, did the draw for the random Patreon game. So I'm going to do the same thing for people here. We are going to have a giveaway at the end of all this. Um, but what is this? Yes, thank you for telling me all this, Steam. Thank you. Um, but, uh, we have one more thing I wanted to do, which is I promised that once a month I was going to do a reading, and that is, in fact, what I am going to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on my friends from Tall Heights again. They're going to be accompanying me music-wise, and we're going to do a reading. And the reading is going to be from this. Give me a minute. Reading is from this, When the Villain Comes Home, edited by Gabriel Harbowy and Ed Greenwood. Make sure, by the way, that the music is not too loud. Is the music okay? Not too loud? Thank you for the uh, hoster. <laughs> so is this good? Not too loud? You guys can still hear me over this okay? People can hear me okay? Good, good. Check one, two, two. Can you hear me? Everything you do? Good? All right, cool. So, uh, this reading is going to be, uh, so again, this is going to be fulfilling this part of the Patreon. When this is done, and this will probably take about 20 to 25 minutes to read, I would guess. When this is done, uh, then I am going to uh, do a giveaway, and then we'll do a raid, and we're going to go on from there. So, if anyone comes in, I don't want to have to stop, though, uh, when I start the reading, so... If anyone comes in and says, what the hell is this? If someone could just very nicely explain what's going on, uh, that would be appreciated. So again, this is available. This came out back in 2012, I believe is when it was published, yes. And it actually won a Forward um, Book of the Year award um, for one of the best anthologies, or was nominated for Forward Book of the Year, which was cool. Um, and I had a um, short story in here along with Mercedes Lackey, who's pretty famous, and Jay Lake, who sadly passed away a year ago. Um, but uh, I happen to have a stay a story in here as well. And this story is actually also part of a larger um, work that at some point I will complete. It's kind of on the back burner for now. Um, but um, it involves a uh, character uh, called a uh, Presul, and there's another character as well as kind of like a bounty hunter. And so um, this is called the Presul's Call. Um, and uh, yeah, this is basically my first officially published story. So, so this is it. You guys hyped? You ready? You ready? For the reading? Ready? 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 That's troubling. What's up, Reggie? How you doing, man? <laughs> nice. I lost myself. Lost myself in it. Lost myself in it. All right. Let's do it up. This is the Pressul's Call, and this was actually written originally for my daughter um, when she was younger. So this is actually uh, for my daughter, Senevine, and it's called, again, the Pressul's Call. I'm going to turn down. I'm going to turn down the volume a little bit on those guys. Okay, here we go. Jaketh Aralok, fourth warden of the Hammers, servant to the successor king and supreme ruler of the Dovind Empire, Arsheth was tired. It was more than tiredness, really. It was bone weariness, practically full-on exhaustion. Not from exertion, though he'd had plenty of that over the past few days. Tracking a bellino was no easy affair, even when the thing was careless. But this was no ordinary bellino. It had been trained well by its masters, and in truth it had not been far from the border, scuttling rapidly on its eight segmented legs with barely a whisper of noise, when Jaketh finally caught up to him. The fight had been swift and deadly, with little doubt about the ultimate outcome. In fact, the Bellino seemed somewhat listless during the fight, disinterested, as if it had already accepted its fate and had decided to commit suicide by allowing Jaketh an easy way inside its defenses, and one powerful slash with his axe had ended its life forever. Still, this was minor compared to the kind of tracking he'd done before, even with all the work beforehand in discovering who or what had trained the Bellino in the first place. 
And as for what he had done to the trainer... Shanak's blood, leave it alone, he growled to himself, running a hand over his furry snout in mild annoyance while the other hand tightened slightly around the strap of the pack slung over his shoulder. The thoughts he had when he was this fatigued were reason enough not to let himself get this way. But he knew a few hours of sleep wouldn't be enough to feel fully rested. His heart was tired, and for that there was only one place which promised respite, Baylor's Reach and home. The Regent General Espeth Bartul, graying muzzle locked in a frown, had said little when Jaketh had made his request. Espeth always kept his true feelings to himself, even when they were, as was often the case, less than generous. One week. One week? That's... Well, thank you, Regent. I am grateful. Show your gratitude by doing your work all the better when you return, the Regent General said as he turned and strode away. Which will be on the eighth day by noon, son, he added over his shoulder, not looking back or your notice of removal from the hammers will come on the edge of another warden's axe. The very day Jaketh had set out for home, traveling for a day by wagon over the border and into Stumgard. Few creatures lived on the road between the imperial city of Edrith and Stumgard, other than guardsmen and an occasional fox or rabbit that darted away as the wagon approached, and for this Jaketh was grateful. He even chose to sleep in the wagon rather than pay for an inn, or commandeer a room for the owner as imperial law permitted him to do. He'd had more than his fill of the usual fearful silence which quickly pervaded the places he entered, and the hateful glances or whispered curses from the more foolish creatures within earshot now inspired more weariness than anger. The next morning he continued to journey on foot, traversing the remaining miles to the lower hills before turning off the main road and up onto the gentle grassy slopes. There was no path for some time, and indeed none was needed. It was early fall and harsh weather was still several months away. Jake had passed to one to pass no one as he trudged up the grassy sward, the sun warming the soft breeze which ruffled his fur. But for once he not only needed but welcomed the solitude. There wouldn't be much of it when he got to Baylor's Reach. He hadn't been back for four years, and then only for a few days. Certainly Farsha would be happy to see him, and Morleith, even Carrick, blood poisoned the old fool, he thought with a slight grin. And Harith, of course. Harith would be the happiest of all. It would be a strange feeling to be welcome anywhere. Respect was easy. His cloak and warden's brooch ensured that. But to be admired, or loved, that would be an odd sensation indeed. He needed it. The promise of rest was drawing him home, but the possibility of peace, a few days or even hours with no missions, no discipline, no iron axe at his back while a fugitive ran from his relentless pursuit, was even more intoxicating. Farsha would probably scold him and demand he cut some firewood behind the inn as penance for his lengthy absence, but even that felt like grace and comfort. Hours passed as Jake had steadily climbed, watching as the angle of the rolling hills became more pronounced and the grass slowly gave way to scrub brush and rocks. He had encountered little wildlife beyond insects and the occasional bird overhead, and as he left the grass light behind and the temperature grew colder, even those creatures became more rare. As a child, he had rarely come even this far below Baylor's reach. He was a full-grown adult before ever setting foot on the road leading to Edrith, now he had been to almost every corner of the Empire, met members of races from every part of the known world, and the places of his younger days had become the foreign territories. But there were ghosts and shadows here, resonances he remembered echoing deep within him. He was nearly home. The sun had long since passed its zenith when he finally reached the path leading from Baylor's reach to the watchtowers, twisting and turning as it wound from the lower foothills of the Calatus Mountains into the upper hills of Stonegard. Here the grass was almost completely replaced by rocky outcroppings and occasional brush, and as Jaketh turned under the final stretch of the path leading to the village, he stopped and breathed deeply. The air had a cooler, crisper flavor, but summer had not entirely given up its hold. He was no more than a half hour away now, and he had half a mind to ask Farsha for a bowl of her best stew as soon as he arrived, no matter how upset she was. Then he heard the sound. It was a strange, high, warbling noise, rising like a feather on the breeze before fading into a vanishing whistle. Distress? Pain? Or a warning call? But certainly not an imperial one, or any that he knew. It came again, slightly tremulous and louder, before dying away. Jaketh hesitated and turned, his eyes narrowed slightly as he looked to the western sky where the sun was turning a slow orange in its descent. It would set in an hour, and the remaining light would be gone a half hour after that. Again the noise sounded, this time somehow sweeter and lighter, before fading as quickly as before. It couldn't be far away, but his time was short. And what did it matter what some strange noise... Again he heard it, this time shrill and piercing, almost desperately intense, 
and he winced for a moment before the sound dissipated again into silence. Blood, he growled quietly. You just can't leave it alone, can you? You can't let a loose end. He sighed, then shook his head again, and turning from the path, set off at a good pace up the hill to his right in the direction of the noise. If he hurried, he could find out what in Shanak was making that sound and be back on his way home with plenty of time to spare. It continued as he went, alternating from loud and piercing to cool and soothing with each new call, and after twenty minutes he began to wonder how badly he had misjudged the distance. It seemed no closer now than when he had started, though the echoes made by the rocks surrounding him made it difficult to tell for certain. He had just about decided to give up and turn around. The sun was sinking fast, and Laskin take him if he was going to wander the hills at night in search of a meaningless noise, when he made his way above the crest of a hill and stopped short at the site in front of him. He had come to a small clearing of sorts, with stones and rocks of various sizes littering the ground. A few pillars of rock stretched twenty or more feet above his head, extending from the side of the cliff wall which fell abruptly away perhaps fifty feet in front of him, the orange light of the setting sun casting strange, impossibly long shadows across the rough surface of the clearing. And there, lying on the ground at the base of one of the pillars, seated amongst a shower of rocks as if it had been placed there, was a small basket. Suddenly the trilling sound rose from inside the basket, so loud this time he nearly covered his ears before it faded again. He set down his pack and walked slowly over to the source of the noise, hesitating for a moment before looking down. Some kind of wool or hair lined the inside of the basket, and lying atop the wool, he saw a tiny creature, wide beak, opening and closing, covered in bluish-gray down, squirming and struggling while its miniature wings worked feebly. Jaquette's mouth dropped open. A pressul. Immediately the warden's head snapped up and turned, hackles raised, his eyes scanning the area out of habit before his rational mind took over and reminded him of the facts. A prank? A dangerous one if so, and violating at least four imperial laws and edicts he could think of off the top of his head. But even if some young Kalok from Baylor's Reach was stupid enough to bring a pressel here, how could he have done it? Villagers seldom strayed more than a mile or two outside of their own lands, and that only if they were traveling to sell goods in Edrith. Even those travelers wouldn't be able to procure a pressel, not without going through the black market, which was risky enough. Traders found guilty of buying and selling outside sanctioned markets would have their tongues cut out if they were lucky, and anyone found with a pressel within the boundaries of the Dovend Empire would be executed in short order. Not a prank, then. A trap. For whom? Besides Espeth Bartul and a few residents of Baylor's Reach, who even knew he was here? And what kind of trap? Jaquette sniffed the air and smelled nothing more unusual than the pressel, and there were no rocks large enough to conceal someone watching in any case. He walked to the edge of the clearing and looked down. The wall was sheer here. From this edge, the drop would be a hundred feet at least to the tree line below, and there were no creatures visible as far as he could see in any direction. The keening call floated again from behind him, loud and insistent and he turned away from the edge of the clearing and walked back to the basket. The pressel seemed impossibly small to be making a noise this powerful, and he watched in a mixture of fascination and mild distaste as it trilled itself into silence again. He'd never seen a pressel this young before. In fact, he wondered if any Kalok, even a warden, had seen a baby pressel, given the dangers involved in being found with one. Suddenly a flash of color next to the basket caught his eye, and kneeling down he carefully moved the basket away from the rock pile. A hand, covered in feathers, lay underneath. Frowning, Jaketh moved more rocks out of the way, taking care not to set the pile moving again until the arm attached to the hand was exposed. Another minute of clearing revealed the torso, and soon thereafter the head. It was an adult, Presul, clearly female from the angle of the eyes, her head broken and covered in congealed blood. The coldness of her body told the warden she had been dead for some hours, and the size of the wound on her head was enough to tell him what she died of. Rock slides, especially small ones, were a constant problem in this area of the Calatus foothills. Those who grew up in the area knew the signs to look for. Newly disturbed stone, rattling and shaking nearby, long open paths closed, or long closed paths suddenly open. But unprepared strangers to the region could easily find themselves on unstable ground or buried under loose stone and rocks in a matter of moments. On rare occasions, the result was death. Jaketh rubbed the back of his neck and sighed. It was probably just as well. A pressel found inside the border of the Empire would be killed on the spot, and depending on the guard doing the finding, the death might have been much more painful than this. But why a pressel would bring her hatchling into Stumgard in the first place, and why here in particular? 
The loud call of the infant pressel jarred Jacob out of his reverie, and with a soft growl he looked back down at the squirming creature in the basket. It was miraculous that it hadn't died already, in truth. It certainly looked healthy enough, despite how many hours it must have been without food or shelter. He blinked as the late sun's light passed the level of an overhanging rock and shot into his eyes. Better get it over with if I want to get home, he thought, and with another sigh he unfastened the hand axe at his belt. Time to follow your mother, he said gruffly as he lifted the axe high above the basket. Then, for the first time, the pressel opened its eyes, black as ebony, and looked right at the warden for a moment before crying out again. But this time the call was soft and quiet, very short, and Jacquette's eyes widened. His axe nearly slipped from his hands, and he stared mutely at the pressel as he sat back on his haunches. I'm too tired. I've been on the road too long. It can have said... Again it called quietly in its strange, high voice, the same short sound, its eyes fixed steadily on his while its wings worked and body shifted. It wasn't possible, but it sounded as if it had spoken in Kalak. A simple word, an old one. Sarva, it said. Mama. And suddenly a scene flashed through Jacquette's mind, one he had not thought of in many years. Him running as a young cub across the fields on the other end of Baylor's reach towards his home, fields small enough for him to know every blade of grass on their surface and large enough to be his kingdom. The late sun shooting across the landscape past the house, silhouetting it, and the Kalok standing on the back steps calling him, Jaketh, come home, Jaketh, it's time for dinner. Jaketh, come home. And the young Jaketh laughing and calling back, I'm coming, Sarva, Sarva, I'm almost there. It was gone as quickly as it had come. Jaketh the warden remained on his knees beside the infant Pressoul and its dead mother. He waited for a few moments before almost unconsciously reattaching the axe to his belt. The Pressoul was quiet now its eyes still focused on him. Laskin take you, Jacob growled finally after a few long moments, but there was no menace in his voice. He stared at the pressel before letting his gaze slip to the mother. Her legs were still covered by rocks, but most of the rest of her was now uncovered, and Jacob saw a hard wooden case strapped to her belt. Carefully unfastening the clip which held it to the belt and opening it, he saw a mass of cloth and will, within which, wool within which sat four small glass bottles filled with some kind of whitish liquid, each one capped with a rubber tip. Suddenly he heard voices growing louder from behind him. Kalux. They had probably heard the pressel's call just as he had. But if they found it here... Jacob hesitated. And then, for reasons he could not explain... He scooped up the small basket and case and strode to his pack, pulled out the spare cloak and hood from inside, and replaced them with a wooden case and basket. He had time to close the pack again and lay the cloak and hood on top of it before three Kaloks carrying sides came into view, stopping as they saw him. Two were young, squat with brown fur, but the third was almost his age and height, covered in mottled black and brown, and after a second he broke into a grin and stepped forward. "'I never knew you liked spending time at the edges of cliffs, Jaketh. The black brown Kalok said in a gravelly voice. Or does the Empire train you to search rock piles? Jaketh smiled. Only when nearby villagers can't keep their lands clean of them, Harith. Harith barked a laugh. <laughs> We're not educated enough out here to learn cleanliness, he replied as he strode to Jaketh and embraced him. Blood, it's good to see you, he said, stepping back and looking him up and down with an appraising eye. The army hasn't made you fat and lazy yet. Suddenly he blinked in turn, gesturing to the two brown-furred Kaloks behind him to come forward. Baileth and Shakith Farkesh, my nephews. They were away from Baylor's reach the last time you were here, and before that they hadn't even been born. And this, he said to the two Kaloks as he nodded in Jaketh's direction, is Jaketh Aralok. This is the warden? Baileth yelped before wincing and lowering his head. Yes, Harith acknowledged with a frown. But as I told you before, Baileth, he's here to rest, not talk about his time with the hammers. He grinned as the young Kalok nodded sullenly. Baileth's been interested in joining the Imperial Army since a soldier came to Baylor's reach three years ago. He spent more time daydreaming about battles and war and glory than doing his chores. Jaketh nodded. I felt the same way before I joined. But I wouldn't rush to leave the village, Baileth. We all grown up soon enough. Harith laughed again. You're turning philosopher on me, Jaketh. That can't be right for a warrior. If I... What do you have in your pack? Jaketh suddenly said. Jaketh felt his throat constrict, but before he could think of a reasonable answer, Harith jumped in. What kind of impolite nonsense is this? I saw the cloak on top of his pack move, the young Kalok replied. 
Harris smiled wryly and opened his mouth as if to scold his nephew again, but suddenly his grin fell away as he caught sight of something. He walked past Jaketh, who turned to see him stop and stare down at the dead pressel in the rock pile. He looked back at Jaketh, his lip curled in an expression of disgust. "'Did you do this?' he asked Jaketh, who walked slowly up to the pile. "'No,' the warden replied, pointing at the pressel's bloody head. "'The rocks killed her long before I got here. Probably hours ago.' "'Killed it, you mean,' Harith said in a low growl, turning his gaze downwards again as a wide-eyed bailiff and Shakeheath came along, the mysteriously moving pack apparently forgotten. "'Pity you didn't. It deserved to die slowly.' not with a simple blow to the skull. Jaketh looked at his friend's face, contorted with anger. It's never gone away, has it? Not even after all this time. Harith stared down silently for a few more seconds, then spat forcefully and turned away. We were on the way back from the eastern fields when he heard this strange calling. Normally we ignore noises around here, but I knew you were due to arrive and wanted to make sure nothing unusual happened. He looked at Jaketh, a question in his eyes. Jaketh nodded. I heard the same thing. When I got here, this is... all I found. Blood, Harith swore. What's the Empire coming to when it allows this filth to come here unchallenged? When I get in the army, I won't let it happen, Uncle, Bayless said, gripping his side with a growl. I'll stop them before they get anywhere close to Baylor's reach. Harith cuffed his nephew lightly in the back of his head as a faint smile returned to his face. First you need to stop the frost from getting into the cabbages, he said, not unkindly but Jaketh could tell his thoughts were elsewhere. Then he blinked and shook his head. We don't have time to deal with this now. The sun's almost set. We'll have to send someone up here to clean this place properly when we can. He glanced at Jaketh. Unless the Empire is going to want to look into this. Jaketh shook his head. Searching Jake, uh, Jaketh shook his head. The hammers have bigger things to attend to than a dead pressel that took a wrong turn, he said with an attempt at a smile. Harith nodded thoughtfully, searching Jaketh's face for a moment. All right, then. Grab your gear and let's be on our way. Farster will have both of our heads if I don't get into the village before nightfall. Jake had slung the pack over his shoulder and laid the cloak and hood over his arm as the four Kalox left the clearing, but not before Jake had took a final look behind him at the pile of rocks in the dimming light, feeling the basket in his pack shift slowly. Night had indeed fallen by the time the Kalox reached Baylor's Reach, but despite his friend's prediction, Farsha was so happy to see Jaketh that he was more worried about suffocation than decapitation as she hugged him fiercely. He ate as quickly as he could manage without being insulting. Farsha's, temperature, te Farsha's temper was nearly as legendary as her crucial stew, and having escaped with a plea of fatigue and a promise to be up bright and early to help fix the inn's leaky roof, retired to the room upstairs where he had stowed his pack. Whether from fear or its own exhaustion, the infant pressel had been silent since they left the clearing, and Jaketh was worried it might not have survived the trip. But there it was, twittering softly at him as he pulled the basket from the pack and set it on the table near his bed. He watched the iridescent wings shift as the beak opened and closed, wondering what was keeping it so calm. Or him, for that matter. One of the pressel's calls would send the inn and half of Baylor's reach into an uproar, and if he were found with it in his room, Shanak only knew what he'd say to explain it. Yet for the first time in years, his dreams and senses were quiet, dully peaceful. Tired. He growled gruffly to himself as he watched the pressel kick its tiny legs about. Too tired to think, too tired to care. Reaching into the pack, he drew out the case and opened it, removing one of the bottles and holding it to the light of the lantern on the table. The pressel's twittering grew louder, and looking down he saw it straining its neck upwards. He hesitated, then inverted and lowered the bottle. When it was just a few inches away, the pressel grabbed the tip in its beak and began to suck greedily. And there Jaketh sat. Fourth Warden of the Hammers, blood-sworn to defend the life and dominion of the successor king of the Dovend Empire, feeding an infant pressel. Days seemed to blur into each other, each with the same pattern. He'd wake up, groggily feed the pressel, then return the basket to his pack and place it beside his bed before heading downstairs, where Farsha and another resident of Baylor's Reach would be waiting to greet him, always with a smile and request for aid, anything from tracking down a wayward goat to helping harvest a wheat field to fixing a failing fence gate. He didn't mind, though oddly he now felt more at peace taking care of the pressel in his room than he did with the villagers. It slept most of the time and only ate twice a day, no more than a third of a bottle each time, which was good since Jake had no idea what he was going to feed it when the milky liquid was gone. 
On one occasion, he clumsily steered the mealtime conversation towards the subject of feeding practices for children, confusing to no end Farsha and old Carrick, who had come to visit. "'You've been spending a lot of time in your room,' Harith observed one cloudy afternoon as they were threshing the wheat in one of the fields at the far western end of the village's borders. "'I would have thought you'd want to take all the time you could with us.' "'You don't think I have?' Jacob replied, grunting slightly as he swept his scythe across the swaying grain. For the first time in the week since he had arrived in Baylor's Reach, the sky was clouded over, and a growing wind and the dampness of the air promised rain. I've spent every spare second tending to a sinkhole in a field or a creaky floorboard, and if I have to track down Morley's goat one more time, I'll send the blood-cursed thing to Laskin myself. He laughed, but Harith did not smile. That's not what I mean, Jaketh. You've been almost silent since you got here. I thought you wanted to come home to get away from the problems of the Empire. Instead, it feels like you brought him home with you. Jacob dropped the blade of his side to the ground and leaned on the handle, looking at Harith. The faintest bit of gray had snuck into the black and brown around his muzzle, and the skin around his eyes betrayed a slight wrinkle. Blood, he's getting older, Jacob thought. But then, so am I. But he simply shook his head and smiled. Sorry, life in the hammers is difficult to get away from sometimes. You mean the people around you won't let you get away from it? Harith replied. The ones who curse you, spit at you, who think of you as one of Arshat's trained dogs that he throws raw meat for his enjoyment? Jacob's head snapped up, eyes narrowed in anger as his hands tightened around the scythe, but Harith did not step away. I've heard the stories about the hammers, Jacob. Most people in Baylor's Reach don't know what you do, but I do. At least some of it. He shook his head and sighed. I can't pretend to know what it's like, of course. You always saw more than I did thought more than you told me, even when we were cubs. He looked away into the horizon where the clouds were darkening. And if what you do helps, helps stop what happened to... He trailed off and blinked, then turned back to Jaketh with a fierce expression. Then it's worth it, no matter what anyone thinks of you. It's worth it to me. He held Jaketh's gaze for a moment, then turned away and walked off, holding his side loosely in one hand as the warden watched him go. That night was a bad one for Jaketh, the worst he'd had in several weeks. He tossed and turned in restless sleep. Flames licked the edges of the city where he wandered with his axe, seeking survivors while the cries of the dead and dying fell thickly on the air until he thought his lungs were too full of it to breathe. Loud explosions sounded nearby, and the wind whipped the stinging smoke into his eyes. Suddenly, very close by, he heard a loud, twittering cry and coming around the corner of the house in front of him he saw three bird-like creatures, two adults and a child huddled together. One of the adults stood up shakily. Please, it said, please, you've already won. Leave them alone. Take me instead. Jacob's vision was tinged with red, the roar of the sulfurous wind in his ears. No, he said, and his voice was a deep snarl, hoarse and guttural. No, not instead and with a spin he brought his axe down diagonally across the pressel's chest as the others screamed. Then the house next to him exploded, throwing him clear, and he found himself awake, panting on the floor by the side of his bed. The window of his room was banging wildly, sheets of rain sweeping through the opening. The door to his room was ajar, and his pack lay open on the ground. The basket was gone. Before he could process what had happened, he heard Farsha crying for him downstairs, and springing to his feet he seized his hand axe and cloak from the table and ran downstairs to find her, wrapped in a blanket, pointing at the door of the inn. It had been broken from its hinges, and kneeling next to it was Baileth Farakesh, Harith's nephew. The warden strode over to him and lifted him by the scruff of his neck to a standing position. "'What's going on?' he barked at Baileth, who struggled in his grip. "'What have you done?' "'It's my uncle!' Baileth howled back. "'He broke into the inn!' He said he needed to see something. I followed him in, and then I heard a banging sound upstairs. Well, then he ran past me and shoved me into the door. What was he carrying? Jaketh growled angrily, teeth bared. Where was he going? Tell me now, or I'll do a lot more than push you into a door. I- Ow! Baileth wailed. I don't know where he was going. He wouldn't tell me. He was carrying something, but I couldn't- What was it? Jaketh snarled. I- Ow! A basket! It looked like some kind of basket! By the time Farsha reached Baileth's whimpering body slumped by the door, Jaketh was already halfway out of Baylor's reach at a full run. Harith could be anywhere, but as Jaketh sprinted up the path, leaping over fallen trees and seeking purchase in the loose rocks at his feet while the driving rain blinded him, he knew there was only one place he would choose to go now. Yes, only one place. 
It had taken Jaketh and the other Kalox a little less than half an hour to make their way from the clearing by the edge of the cliff to Baylor's Reach five days ago, but that was at a regular walking pace. Jaketh was running now, and wardens were famed for their stamina and speed when tracking a target, tireless and sure-footed. Still, he was running on muddy, unstable ground and wind so fierce he could see small stones scattering across his path, and he was pursuing someone even more familiar with the terrain it was, with the same ability to see in the dark. So it still took him about twenty minutes to reach his destination, and when he first crested the hill and slowed to a stop, his heart sank. He saw no sign of Harith, and for a moment he thought he had been wrong. Then the lightning flashed behind him, and a bright burst of light from the opposite edge of the clearing blinded him. Blinking to clear his vision as the clap of thunder rolled across the sky, he saw its source. Light reflecting off a blade. On his knees, only a short distance away from the edge of the cliff, was Harith, his fur matted, lifting a long dagger into the air. And below him on the cold stone ground, its basket gone, lay the baby Presul, squirming and flapping its wings uselessly. Harith! Jacob barked. Harith, stop! The blade froze for a moment then began its upward track again. In the name of the successor king, I order you to stop! Jacob shouted again as the wind whipped around him. The blade stopped again, and this time Harith looked in his direction at another bolt, as another bolt of lightning in the sky illuminated his eyes, wild with hatred. The successor king! Harith cried mockingly as the thunder rolled. That's something, Jacob, even for you. Call in the name of your emperor when you've been committing treason by sheltering his enemies. I'm sorry, Harith, Jacob replied, taking a step closer. I found it here with its mother, and I... Well, I don't know why I took it with me. It seemed like the right thing to do. The right thing! Harith screamed in a rage. It was the right thing to feed and shelter this filthy vermin in Farsh's inn? To bring this excrement to the village where you were raised? To give comfort to a pressul? Please, it said. Please, you've already won. It's a child, Harith, not a warrior, Jacob shouted. A helpless infant. An infant that'll grow into an adult that'll kill us if it can, like every one of these blood-cursed pieces of filth, which killed... Harith stopped, his speech choked with a sob. Leave them alone. We fight for order, not vengeance, Jacob yelled back. None of this will bring Sharath or Cyril back, Harith. You fight for what you will, Harith screamed. You sell your honor for whatever you want. I swore an oath on their graves, and this fulfills it. Take me instead. Suddenly the pressul called out the noise piercing, almost agonizing, and crying out in pain, Harith lifted his dagger again. Then time seemed to slow as Jacob drew out his axe and in one smooth motion hurled it towards Harith. The dagger was beginning its downward plunge when the axe hit it square, knocking it clear from Harith's hand and sending it plunging over the cliff's edge with a clatter. Harith howled in anger and charged at Jacob, who dropped low as Harith reached him and undercut his legs, sending him flying over his body in a heap. Jacob backed up slowly as Harith got to his feet, panting heavily as the rain drove down on him. Pressu loving filth, he growled. Blood cursed cur! He ran towards Jacob again, who without thinking spun away at the last second as his warden training had taught him. Harith threw his arms out but missed, and with no chance to stop himself went flying over the edge with a rapidly fading howl. Jacob scrambled to the edge and looked down into the dark. Harith! he shouted but his voice was caught up by the wind which roared in mockery as he sank back. I... I had no time to... I reacted the way a warden should. Except he was not fighting an enemy of the Empire. This was his friend Harith, and he had killed him. Suddenly there was another flash of lightning followed by a crash of thunder. But as the thunder died away, Jacob heard an odd whirring noise over the sound of the tempest, growing louder by the second, a noise both foreign and strangely familiar. He looked back over the edge. Rising from the void below was a feathered creature, wings flapping strongly against the wind. And in its arms it carried... Harith? The adult Pressul was indeed carrying Harith, and Jacob watched as it flew over his head and landed softly in the clearing behind him before laying the black-brown calyx motionless body on the ground and turning to face him, its massive wings folding smoothly into place behind its back. It cocked its head at him. Clock caught before the trees, it said at last in heavily accented Kalok. Not dead. It looked past Jaketh, who continued to stare at it in wonder, and caught sight of something next to him. It walked to his side and bent down. Slowly, gently, it lifted the baby pressul, wet and quietly twittering, and gazed into its face, tilting its angular head and trilling back softly. After a moment, it looked up at Jaketh. 
This mine, my share, showed? Last one. Jake had swallowed. Last child? The pressel moved its head in what Jake had assumed was an approximation of a nod. Most families killed by clocks month ago, except for maid and our childs, it said, still struggling with the word. It stopped, twittering for a moment as if remembering. Lightning flashed in the sky again, but farther off now, and the downpour was lessening. Escaped, maid and child and me. Flew north, but mate was hurt, couldn't fly far. Stopped here to rest while I looked for food and way home. Got back and found mate dead, child gone. It paused. Thought I'd stay and die here, too. But you didn't, Jake had said. No. Flew everywhere looking for child, found nothing. Suns rose and set. Finally storm came. But why would you catch har the Kalok, Jake had said. He wanted to kill your child. The pressel twilted, twittered quietly. You, Kalok, didn't kill child. It moved its wings in an odd way, almost a shrug. Life is life. It stopped, struggling again. Life comes from life. Must come from life. Nothing else. Even clock's life. Jake hath nodded slowly. And now? Now we go home. It turned and walked to the edge of the cliff. After a few steps, it stopped and turned, its head cocked. Why? Why clock save child? Clock hate us, yes? Like other clock. Jake hath opened his mouth and closed it. Before he could try again, the baby pressel lifted its head over its father's hand and twittered softly. Jake hath hesitated a moment longer, then shrugged. Life is life, he said. The pressel had the warden's gaze steadily for a long moment, then turned without a word, and spreading its wings wide, sprang from the ground and flew off, illuminated one last time by a fading flash of lightning, before vanishing into the gathering darkness. The next morning, Farsha, having finally fallen asleep from exhaustion, woke to find a note on the counter in the downstairs room of the inn. Farsha, on my way back to Edrith, left money upstairs to pay for damage to room. Harith is at his home, safe. When he comes to find you, please tell him I tried to help him and someone else. I've never been a word master, but... Anyway, life is life. Tell him that. Shanak protect you, Jacob. The end. The end. <clears throat> so, that was the Pressel's call. And yeah, as I say, there's actually a novel that's uh, based in that world at some point. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much, and thank you guys for listening. I saw uh, Wonders, you jumped in there. Thank you. Thank you, Gaiman. Uh, I saw you jumped in there, and yeah, it's fine. I mean, the overall, the point is that the overall thrust of the channel has to be games. The overall thrust of this can't channel is so clearly into the game area that, you know, reading something once in a while is not a big deal. Avis Ex Machina. <laughs> Thanks, Darkin. So yes, I, oh, sorry. Banged into the desk. Um, I've read that before. Why is there a picture of Arv with his eyes rolled in the back of his head in my Fallen directory? I'm supposed to hand out tissues at this point. Aw. Well, that's nice. Yeah, that's that story I wrote for my daughter, um, who actually probably is old enough now. I wrote this for her a couple of years ago. She's probably old enough now that I could read it to her, so I may have to do that. But anyway, as I said, short story is going to be read, uh, or something like it, once a month, either from me or someone else. And so I read this a few years back, I believe, on here, but so... Uh, there's not more yet, but there will be. There's actually a novel um, called Sunrise and Empire, which is part of a trilogy um, that I started and got about 18, 19,000 words into, um, but it's on the back burner at the moment, and it's honestly, it's kind of far on the back burner because I got to finish this book that I'm doing right now that's in progress. Then I've got Gray Shade that I've got to tweak, which is coming out next year. Then Renegade, which is the sequel to Gray Shade. Then the third book after that, which is the sequel to that. Then quite possibly the re-release of the Third Sign. The next two books in that series, and then I might get back to Sunrise and Empire. So it's a lot of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Shadow. 
and thanks CMC. Yeah, I hope you guys liked it. Um, so, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed writing that. And uh, the whole conceit of this is this book was there's a book they did an anthology called When the Hero Comes Home, which is what happens when the hero comes back from war or from whatever he's doing or she's doing. What happens when they get back, right? What is life like afterwards? For those of you who've read Lord of the Rings, like Scouring of the Shire type stuff. So this was what happens when the villain gets home. And so I wanted to play a little bit with someone that would be called a villain depending on your perspective. But if you're outside of that environment. Obviously, the press rules, a lot of people around would call the Kalox, and in particular, the Wardens. Um, and this guy is one of the Wardens. They would call Jaketh a villain. Maybe not so much. So, Cool, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. And I, uh, I, you know, as I say, once a month for like 20 minutes to a half hour is not a big deal. But I appreciate that. Cool. Thank you, Wolf. Why am I such a slacker? Yeah. Why am I such a slacker? Anyway, well, good. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. I love sharing that stuff uh, when I can. So another one of those will come next month. But now uh, let us do our giveaway. Um, and we are going to get that done. Okay. So the giveaway tonight, folks, is going to be as follows. You will have a choice of one of the three following games. And let's see. Let's choose from the following three games. And they are as follows. Have I played the board? I haven't, Wonders, although actually they had a bunch of that stuff. Um, they had a bunch of legendary uh, at um, Origins. Uh, they had a bunch of them like in the front of the hall. There was a table there where they were demoing it. Um, I have a Lord of the Rings like limited collectible card game, and I have the Pathfinder Venture card game. The problem is I love board games. I have like hundreds of board games and card games. The problem is that with all of those games and legendary is part of it, I just can't keep up with getting outbought. You know, I just can't keep spending money on, like, just time, like, money sink, money sink, money sink, and also time sink. Like, as Lego mentioned, I play Hearthstone once in a while on my tablet because I can play it on my tablet and because I pay zero for it. You know, it's just, I, I don't buy anything ever from it. Um, so it's just kind of like a diversion, whereas this other stuff is sort of more occupied than that. As far as playing board games on stream with friends in general, though, yes, I would. And in fact, that's what I wanted to do at ARFCON. At some point, I'll see a way that I can try to get that done, because I would like to do some board games on stream. I think it'd be fun and different, and I have some cool games that I think you guys would enjoy watching. Um, so it'd be, it'd be fun to try it out. But I have heard good things about Legendary. Yeah. Uh, okay, so choices are as follows. If you win tonight, you'll have one of the following three choices. Choice number one comes to us uh, courtesy of Leshrac, and it is Teleglitch. Choice number one is Teleglitch, um, and this is a humble bundle option, actually. So choice number one is Teleglitch. That's from Leshrac. Choice number two comes to us from... Uh, let's see. Let's make the second one come to us from... Um, let's make it uh, The Gentleman. And we're going to make it Puzzle Agent. So Puzzle Agent is the number one. Oh, really? Yeah, Wonders. Uh, I play both, Lego. I mean, my I, the highest I've ever got... I've only played for like three weeks, and my highest rank was like 17, so I'm not very good. But um, Puzzle Agent from The Gentleman. And then your third and final possible choice comes to you from Kilobyte, and that is the Mortal Kombat Complete Edition. This is MK9, Mortal Kombat 9, plus all the DLC. So it's not Mortal Kombat 10. It's Mortal Kombat 9 plus all DLC. So again, your choices are, um, choice number one comes to you from Leshrac, that is Teleglitch. Choice number two comes to you courtesy of the Gentleman B, that is Puzzle Agent. And choice number three comes to you courtesy of Kilobyte, and that's Mortal Kombat Complete Edition. And the giveaway um, word is going to be... Let's see, let's make that word... Please type in Johnny in honor of our good friend, the Godling. Please type in Johnny if you guys are interested in winning. And as you do that, I am going to check and see who we're going to raid. Thank you very much, Shadowed, as always. And again, guys, I will be back with you guys on uh, Thursday. Um, I'll be back with you on Thursday. And we'll be playing some more uh, Witcher and doing some more poems, too. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, why not? Sure, Jim. You have five Hearthstone accounts? Holy cow, man. Yeah, no, it's, it's fun. Like, I, you know, I've been enjoying it, but, um, you know, and I go through these, like, I feel like I'm I'm a very, like, streaky player. I feel like I win, you know, a few in a row, and I'm sure I could do even more min-maxing. I do like the fact that I've been able to, like, I've been able to play Arena a few times, and I've been able to play a couple of the solo adventures, uh, and I've been able to do that without spending a cent, because you can just, like, you know, play the game, you know, on and off and whatever, and you can get gold through the game, and then you can use it on the game, which I love. So, you know, I'm sure there's people who can be like, here, $100, bam, I'm better, but it's like, you know, I'm not going to do that, so. It is Harp Streaks. It really is, man. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, like, again, as I say, I think it's cool to sort of see the different effects and things like that, um, but some of the decks are interesting, so. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for stopping by, Gaming. It's good to see you again, man. Good to see you. And again, while you guys are doing this, again, please type in that word Johnny uh, if you guys are interested. And as you guys are typing in that stuff, again, a reminder, if you're new to the stream and you like what you saw and heard, please follow. Um, and also, don't forget exclamation point ArvTube to get to my YouTube channel and follow past broadcasts. Exclamation point Steam Group to get to my Steam Group and join the rest of the Arvanauts. And of course, exclamation point ArvTreon, where you can be part of that. Um, it'll be awesome to have you guys there. Um, if you have not already done so, supporting the Patreon is a great way to support the channel. And we're continuing to try to build support support um, to show Twitch that there is support for the channel so that we can get so that I can get the channel partnered so any support you guys are able to give is certainly appreciated if that is possible um, so thank you very much Jim so with all that said last call last call in this giveaway last call and again I'll be sending something out to the uh, patrons soon also I will send out a copy of the poem um, to the patrons that I read things to tonight which was Fury Fire Epidemic and Gentlemen I mean uh Sorry, Fury Fire, Epidemic, and Dragon Spear, and I will be writing up the rest of it for you guys. Uh, the poems for everybody else will come out in the next couple of days. I love this shirt. Naysayer's gonna naysay. All right. Lego wins. Hacks. Hacks, rig, rigged hacks. Tell the glitch. Nice job, man. I don't think Lego... You haven't won one for me in a while, Lego, I don't think. That is courtesy of Leshrac, of course. And I'm going to send this to you right now. And just make sure that you let me know whether it works, Lego, because it's, uh, it's a Humble Bundle code. All the Humble Bundle codes have been working lately, knock on wood. But just, you know, to be, to be sure. I'm going to send this to you right now. Hang on just a second. All right, and it is on its way to you, Lego. It sounds intellectualist. <laughs> All right, it's on its way to you, and uh, yes, and that, of course, is courtesy of Lush Rack. Thank you for the follow, Gabe and Stain. And welcome back in, man. No, from the old Catabasis days. So again, thanks um, to Leshrac for that, and congratulations, Lego. All right, so as I said, uh, we're going to do that. We're going to do our raid, and EMC has already shown you how to do it. EMC is always ready with those raids. That is, the Arvanauts have landed, um, and the Arvanauts have landed with Volcania. Now again, the key to this is not to do it until you hear my audio outro. Once you hear my audio outro, that's when you drop that in the chat that I'm about to show you in just a moment. Um, but there's lots and lots of good stuff um, that's available here. Uh, and we're going to raid one of those people in just a minute. Actually, one person I thought I was going to raid is logging off, so so I'm not going to log him. Um, but I know who I can raid. I have not raided this person in a long time. Cool. Okay, so we're going to do that in just a second. Um, now, just as a reminder, I'll be back at you guys Thursday night. Um, again, now, Thursday night, I have to warn everybody, Thursday night may be a later start for the stream. Be aware of that. Thursday night may not be until like 9.30 or so, possibly a little later, because um, my daughter's end of school, like 
all school picnic type of thing is happening. It's supposed to be over by like 730. But she lives, you know, the school is about a half hour away from us. So I might get on late on Thursday. Um, she's good. She's getting out of first grade. She's going to be done with first grade in like two days. She's doing. She's going to be in second grade starting next year, which just blows my mind. But anyway, um, so yeah, so just be aware of the fact that I may be a little late um, in getting on on Thursday night. Please bear with me. But we'll be playing day eight at that point of The Witcher 3. And then on Friday, we'll be moving on to either more of The Witcher 3 or possibly a little bit of Icewind Dale. Either way, I'll try to get more of those poems in as well. Don't forget, coming soon in the next couple of weeks, you guys are going to get a chance to make a decision about a game that you'd like me to play or try. Um, and I'd like you guys to to start brainstorming a little bit about what game you'd like me to try. Remember, I reserve the right to veto stuff, so I'm not going to play horror games. I'm not going to do stuff like that. But if there's a game that you think is silly you'd like me to play, or if there's a game that you'd really just like me to play, like has nothing to do with being silly or bad or terrible, you just would like me to play it, um, and you think I would enjoy it, that's cool. Um, we're going to put it up and we'll have a poll and we'll let everybody in the chat vote on it. This is not just for patrons. It's actually for viewers in general. We hit the milestone goal that would allow chat to make that decision. So we'll be doing that in the next couple of days as well. But otherwise, I'll see you guys on Thursday um, as well. Yeah, first grade, the hard knocks grade. Um, thanks, Jen. I appreciate that, man. But uh, yes, so that is what we will do. Um, Kerbal Space Pro. Hey, listen, you know, up to you guys. We'll see. Now, with that said, I'm going to now do the raid, but before I do that, I want to thank everyone who was here that made this awesome, fun stream tonight. I want to thank, of course, uh, Dragons, my wonderful mods, Dragon Spear, Glog, Lego Freak, Shadow Mage, The Gentleman B, and Thor. Great job tonight, guys. As always, I have the best mods on Twitch. You guys are the best. Yet another reason I want the channel to get partnered so that you guys can be modding a partner channel with all the transcoder coolness and stuff like that. So great job, guys, as always. I also want to thank the people who checked in here. My regulars, people like Big Boss and Kay. Good to see you, Big Boss. Captain Bob Sherman, I haven't seen you for a while, Bob Sherman. Hope all's well with you. Good to see Dark and Wolf. Good to see Darth Labby, another one I haven't seen for a while. Good to see, of course, Derp. Of course, EMC. Good to see Epidemic. Uh, good to see Ghost. What's up, Ghost? Good to see Gray Dibbick. Thanks again, as always, Gray, for retweets, etc. I actually forgot to tweet the stream out tonight my bad oh well good to see kanumi good to see kais good to see love shack mccurious mosky bear mr wonders reggie shatter mage all regulars of mine slorm who just left a second ago as i was reading his name so i don't know i guess i can't say uh, so thank you anyway on your way out um thanks of course to shatter mage to squeaky fox to tom tom and to wolf five thank you all so much you guys are the best I love you all you're the best viewers on twitch and yeah i'm really looking forward to what we've got going on over the next uh, couple of months with the witcher arkham knight finishing up with Trails in the Sky, um, doing uh, possibly Choice of Robots, doing the Fighting Fantasy game book towards the end of the month, the D&D stream next week, uh, next month with uh, Ed Greenwood, of course, throwing in some Icewind Dale in there. So some cool stuff coming up, and you guys are going to get to come along for the ride. I will see you guys. That would be lovely, Big Boss, if that happened. That would be lovely. I'd love it, but hopefully soon. Anyway, I love you guys. You're the best. Have a good night, and I'm now going to send you over to do the raid, and the raid is going to be, again, do not go until you hear my audio outro. The raid is going to go here. We're going to go to... No, not quite. I got a little bit left. I got just one session left. I don't have a date for the D&D stream yet. Nope, Shadow, not yet. Uh, and I don't know. Someone can tell you, Lego. I'm not sure. I think it should show you up the top, I believe. Uh, anyway, Graydon is where we're going to go. I haven't raided Graydon for a while, and he's playing Fallout right now. I think it's Fallout 3, if I'm not mistaken. So we're going to go check him out and give him some love, but do not go do it until you hear my audio cue. That's it for me. Love you all. Best viewers on Twitch, and I will catch you guys on Thursday for more of The Witcher 3 with Geralt. See you guys soon. Have a good night.
When you got to 